Season 5, Episode 9 of Futurama is called The Sting. In it, we see the Planet Express crew being presented with a difficult mission, one that they surely cannot accomplish. Bad news, everyone! You're not good enough to go on your next mission. Hooray! Not good enough! Why? Says who? Farnsworth explains that the previous crew died on this mission and that it's simply far too dangerous. This is good news to Bender and Fry, but not to Leela. We are just as good as any of those other crews you sent to their deaths. But Leela, we're no good. I'm scared too, but I'm more scared of disappointing myself. I'm not scared of that at all. <laughs> The mission is to collect honey from a colony of space bees, and at first it seems they are successful despite the difficulty they face. We got lucky this time, but you should be more careful. I don't want anything to happen to you. Thanks, but I can look out for myself. Unfortunately, a captured queen bee wakes up and attacks them. You're gonna have to go through me! Ah! Oh! He's... he's dead. The episode takes a turn as Fry, arguably the most important character of the series, dies to save Leela. We see a funeral, references to the beginning of the series, his past loves and strong sentiments shared by each of the characters. Leela, struggling to deal with her grief, decides to eat space honey, falls asleep, and dreams about Fry. He says he can prove he's real by telling her where he hid a gift for her before the mission. There's just one thing I want you to do. What? I want you to wake up. Make up, but I'm not- In her next dream, Fry takes her dancing in a Venusian garden and drinks hot chocolate with her on Hyperion. Here, take my jacket. You look a little cold. Thank you. Leela talks about how this has to be real because she would never take such good care of herself in her own dreams. So there has to be a way to convince everyone else this is real. All you have to do is wake up. No, no, don't say that! This is real! <laughs> The story starts to get a bit more complicated because Leela wakes up with Fry's jacket, the one he was buried with. When she presents this to the crew, she sees it's actually her jacket. Everything's going to be all right, Leela. What? Leela begins to lose her mind, and she lets everyone know she's been taking space honey, which explains her behavior. One spoonful calms you down. Two helps you sleep. Three will take you to a sleep you will never wake up from. And so she takes two, only to accidentally hit the royal jelly jar, spilling it onto the couch, which brings Fry back to life. You see the DNA from the couch combined with the DNA from when he fell in the jelly. He's back. He's safe. Everything is fine. Neat. Leela lets him know that she's glad he's back, he's not dead, and she wasn't responsible for his death, and that everything is fine. You have to wake up. Wake up? Oh no! No! <gasps> Leela begins to crack up, seeing the crew sing Don't Worry, Be Happy, while gradually all blowing up as a result of bee stings until coming to terms with losing her mind. She ultimately decides to open Fry's coffin to make sure he's still there. Only things get even more difficult for her to understand, and she wakes up. Again. So she decides her mind is falling apart, but that she's sane enough to know that, and she does indeed choose to eat the honey. Three spoonfuls. Enough to sleep forever to be with Fry, since he is alive in her dreams and she doesn't have to deal with him being gone. Only at the last moment, Fry reaches out and tells her she has to fight. What am I supposed to do? Fight it! I can't! You can! The Leela I know doesn't give up this easily. Leela is losing her grip on reality. She lost her closest friend because she endangered the crew on a mission that she only wanted to complete to prove she was better. Her ego and vanity caused so much damage she's contemplating a solution that can let her dream about a world where that isn't the case. And Fry... I'm so scared, Fry! I don't know what to do! Just wake up, Leela. Please, just wake up. As Fry continuously asks Leela to wake up throughout the episode, we eventually hear him breaking down as he says it behind the sound of hospital beeping. Leela wakes up. Fry, you're alive. Leela, you're awake. The ambulance took you here right after the bee stung you. The stinger went right through me and you got all the poison. It turns out Leela's decision to prove she could handle this mission almost killed her. The guilt over the damage she assumed it caused a crew member almost brought her to suicide. In reality, the damage she had done was to herself, and she needed to come to terms with that before realizing that any dream world where everything is perfect and you only made the correct decisions is a dead end. It's a nonsense fairy tale, and fighting to get back to reality is what matters. 
to get back to those you love and who love you. Everything in the episode is now recontextualized as Leela's point of view on the characters instead of them being themselves. On top of that, you see absurd realities of the world being treated as normal, like the stinger being left in Fry's corpse, or Bender immediately selling Fry's possessions, or the professor chopping someone's head off to analyze it. It's not that these things wouldn't happen, it's that this is what Leela would expect to simply be the case in her world, and as the episode continues, we get more and more abstract representations of her mental state. The episode sheds light on Fry's commitment to Leela, giving us clues that he did indeed put his jacket on her because she was cold, he did get her the gift, and his speaking to her is very likely what managed to bring her back, to pull her from the brink. Maybe if you heard a familiar voice, it might help keep your mind together. But who knows if it really got through. It got through, Fry. It got through. Ultimately, it told us what Leela felt about her own actions, what her role is within Planet Express. It showed us how she felt about Fry. It showed us what she loved about Fry, what he acts as in her life. It told us the effect she believes Fry's death would have on the world, and it told us that she blamed herself for everything. Her hubris, her pride, drove the crew to suffer, leading to a final decision to sleep forever. Only she realizes that the pieces of Fry she had left, that she's trying to bring him back, back with that she's willing to die for are the few pieces he's using to get through to her on her actual deathbed to bring her back to the living. His voice guides her back to the real world and he gave up every second to make sure she was okay. Leela spent the episode believing she had killed Fry. Only as it turns out, he was the only person preventing her overwhelming pride and guilt from keeping her in this coma forever. It's bloody brilliant. In Season 5, Episode 21 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The Weight of the World, Buffy has spent the entire season fleeing a god. She's been protecting her sister from this thing that wants nothing less than to kill her, leave this dimension, and leave the apocalypse in her wake. In the prior episode, at the end of her rope, Buffy loses Dawn. The team is crippled, low on resources. It's a simple matter of time before Glory will kill Dawn and Buffy will lose everything. Instead of her usual reaction, to create a new plan, to act fast, to give a speech about this new evil being defeated once and for all, she stops, she sinks, and she is frozen as the episode closes out. Buffy, please! Buffy! We discover in The Weight of the World that Buffy has entered a catatonic state. The pressure of every event during this season has absolutely destroyed her. At least, that's the obvious interpretation one would have, considering all that's happened. Losing Dawn after all that Buffy's been through. I think it's pushed her too far into some sort of catatonia. Willow, the witch in the team, decides to enter Buffy's mind to get her back. Upon entry, Willow sees, as we do, that Buffy is in her childhood home. She's reverted back safely and comfortably to a child. Hi, Willow. Hello, Buffy. Willow opens with explaining how much Buffy is needed, how much she needs to come back. But Buffy's reliving memories, and one that we see is that of meeting her sister for the first time. We then see a visual of Buffy placing a book on a shelf. Strange, but whatever. Willow then witnesses, through Buffy's memory, her discussion with the first Slayer, the one who told Buffy, Death is your gift. Death is what the life of a Slayer brings. Death surrounds her. And again, we see that visual. Then Willow follows Buffy into Dawn's room, and she kills her. Buffy is convinced that death is all she is. This is unsurprising after another significant event in the season. Death is your gift. Upon that notion, we backslide again to Buffy as a child, visiting Dawn for the first time. She's looping on specific memories, that of meeting Dawn, learning the Slayer legacy, and killing Dawn. Only, there's that one extra visual. Willow then starts to get a bit more desperate. This never happened. You never killed your sister. None of this is real. You're stuck in some kind of loop. Buffy seems to be stuck in what could even be called a simple loop. She thinks she killed Dawn, or that her failure led to Dawn's death, meaning she may as well have killed her, and that's all she's good for. But there's that one memory that doesn't quite fit. This. Right here. It happened. I know it's something small, but... 
It's something. Buffy explains this is the place she fears the most, the cause of everything. This is when Buffy quit, just for a second. She was putting a book back for Giles and it hit her. She can't win. Glory will win and Dawn will die. Buffy didn't just know it, she felt it. She wanted it all to end. When Dawn dies, I would grieve that it would be over. I imagined what a relief it would be. Buffy believes that even having those thoughts led to her failure to protect Dawn, and that means it's over. It will always be over. Snap out of it! What? what? All this, it has a name. It's called guilt. Willow explains it's entirely normal to want a break, to want out of this life for even a second to release the weight of the world, but the fact is, Dawn isn't dead, and for every second Buffy chooses to give up, she will make Dawn's death a reality. She has a choice to make, and she must make it now. Willow reaches her, and Buffy is ready to lead. This episode deftly guides you through a rather layered and complex bit of trauma, with visual metaphors and dialogue being blended out of time and space, while Willow acts as the only anchor to the real world. Buffy begins by hiding in her very own childhood memories, metaphorically removing herself from the weight of all responsibility, at the same time enjoying the moment Dawn entered her life. She's clearly consumed by what the first Slayer told her, that death surrounds the Slayer. It is her legacy, her gift. She is being crushed by the weight of these events. The realization, however, is Dawn's death is what took her over the edge. Only as Willow highlights, Dawn is not dead. Dawn is alive and she's waiting to be rescued just like always. The one thing that would ensure her death is to give up. Buffy is realizing that she killed Dawn the second she didn't want to protect her anymore, even for a second. She then believes she's lost. Not because she failed a particular battle, but because she doesn't have the drive to win anymore. Buffy gave up. Whether true or not, whether reasonable or not, she thought it, she believed it, and that destroyed her. Buffy killed Dawn because she no longer believed in the fight. And so Willow, being the grounded, forceful spirit in Buffy's life, tells her exactly what she needs to hear. She takes her out of this waking nightmare, and together they build the strength back up to take glory on, once and for all. Buffy spends the episode believing she killed Dawn, and that this is her hell as a result, to wallow in the realization that she's nothing more than death, only to understand through a trusted friend that it's self-fulfilling. The loss is only so for as long as you don't change it. Making a difference is standing up and fighting. It's bloody brilliant. Ahsoka has been airing recently. The first four episodes were a clusterfuck of abysmal writing, with the primary disaster being a complete lack of anything close to effective characterization for the main cast. I struggle to know just who the fuck any of these cardboard cutouts are or why I should care, and that's from the parts of the show where something happens. A whopping 5%. It doesn't help that the actresses playing this collection of corrugated statues on wheels feel the need to resist emoting as though the survival of Disney's stock prices depend on it. But here we are, the episode where Ahsoka is lost in the world between worlds. A convergence of events, looking to intertwine all aspects of the Force, her history, and the relationships both past and present. All of this because the only character I give a fuck about booped her off a cliff. Ahsoka Tano will finally have to face her old master once again. She will complete her training and come to understand there is quite the journey ahead. Head. You look the same. You look old. <sighs> well, that happens. Okay, so if you don't know, Dave Filoni writes dialogue about as well as Ryan Johnson writes whodunits. It's just dumb! So as much as this shit clunks harder than adamantium anal beads, we're gonna try and work through to the point this episode has to make. It means you still have a chance. A chance? To live. So Ahsoka is here, and she's dying? Interesting, since all three characters I've been referencing are essentially comatose in their respective stories. Live or die. We are then treated to witnessing a great battle in the Clone Wars. I was able to figure this out because of the incredible visuals, not at all because of the zombie pisshat dialogue. 
This is the Clone Wars! Anakin tells Ahsoka that as a leader she will have to make decisions that bring about people's deaths, and that to win the war you have to be a soldier. Is that all I'll have to teach my own Padawan one day? So, Ahsoka is sad that death is a common part of the Jedi, or soldier, or warrior experience. Doesn't it suck that the fate of her Padawan is violence and death? Perhaps it's worth throwing in the towel instead. Strange that she would have this perspective when this is adult Ahsoka reliving child Ahsoka's memory, meaning she she is a person who has completed many campaigns, being motivated to save people's lives. She's not actually young nor inexperienced, because that is the point of the world between worlds, right? Soldiers dying and killing enemies in favor of preventing mass death is a pretty straightforward concept that I figure she understood and valued. Teaching a Padawan to engage in a life like that could be considered quite the positive thing. They may prevent mass suffering, something I figure she knew. I'm teaching you how to leave how to survive. You do that, you're going to have to fight. What if I want to stop fighting? Then you'll die. If you don't fight, you die. Seemingly a very weak version of similar stories, considering how little there is to prompt this. I had no clue Ahsoka was giving up. Where was any of this in the previous episodes, and why was this prompted by Balin talking about death and destruction? Those lines are repeated in the previous Leon. Your legacy, like your masters, is one of death and destruction. She apparently took that criticism so seriously she's now contemplating suicide? In the form of simply giving up? I doubt anything we've heard from Anakin so far is new to her, nor would it be anything that would encourage her to live or die in this scenario, but then I have no idea why she would want to die. It was my fault. They were following my orders. I got them killed. This is war, Ahsoka. As Jedi, it's our job to lead. Ahsoka is apparently having a crisis in which she thinks all she seems to do is add to a path of destruction and death, likely fueled by her tutelage from Anakin, being Darth Vader. Perhaps that is her future too, so why not give up? Something we've had no priors for in her own show whatsoever. And let's be honest, Ahsoka should know every detail about Anakin's much more recent actions from Luke. She did meet him, and she was obviously very invested in her former master's impact on ending the war. Yeah, remember this? Anyone? That was a wasted fucking scene. Ahsoka should know about Anakin's sacrifice, his values beyond that of the twisted machine, and she knew him beforehand. She's currently trying to save the galaxy, and by extension her padawan and close friend, only she lost a fight to this literal who. She knows this guy about as well as the audience does. Still the best character though. I have no clue why now of all times would have her reaching an existential crisis crisis regarding her place in the world and her legacy as a destructive force when she's pretty much been a paragon in everything we've seen of her. She's more motivated now than ever to do the right thing. She is on the cusp of preventing the reignition of the Empire and she's concerned about her actions leading to death. Her inaction will lead to way more death as well as the danger of herself and her close friends. You can't just drop this arc on her out of nothing and you certainly can't do it with about four sentences. But this is where it gets that's complicated. Nobody is agreeing on what the fuck Anakin's lesson even is, especially between those who love the episode. I've read their interpretations, it's the equivalent of a blender of Star Wars flavoured cope. Don't die, live is the takeaway, but many are digging a hell of a lot deeper because Filoni has left this incredibly confusing and vague. People speculate that Ahsoka feels responsible for the deaths Anakin caused as she did not prevent his fall, meaning it's time she gives up? If she had such enormous concerns about these sorts of events and decisions, then why has she been such an active participant in this form of activity without hesitation for so long? Where has this attitude been? Not only are we now heavily writing for the writer to squeeze meaning into this anorexic script, it has nothing to do with why she wouldn't want to live, and it doesn't address what she would know about Anakin. Why in the fucking world would this be dealt with now as opposed to when she found out about Vader? Why wouldn't you wait to prompt this when she goes through something very similar. Leela believed she got a crew member killed. Buffy believed she failed her duty and killed her sister. That's why their journeys were prompted. Ahsoka believes what? That people get hurt in wars where she gives orders? That people will eventually get hurt if she doesn't give up? That she's responsible for the people Anakin killed? That she may become as destructive as Vader? That Sabine is simply fated to become as destructive and death-ridden as everyone else in this line of training? And what? 
what? This was prompted by falling off a cliff? Why are you showing me that she feels bad for the clones that died under her command as though that justifies her belief that she brings death everywhere she goes and thus should die herself? Are we not talking about the lives saved, the places liberated, or the goods served? This was no mistake made based on her own flaws as a character. Does she have no understanding of the context of death? As far as I can tell, we're using clones because there's actually no other reference to force Ahsoka to have this arc. Nobody who died due to her own vices, flaws, or mistakes. And so this is nothing. There's nothing here for Ahsoka as a character to actually have to grapple with. She would never believe she is some destructive force or that she may become one if she continues to fight when she's the only one right now who can make the difference and help. I mean, fuck, she's Filoni's little Star Wars god. She is the bestest and brightest, most wonderful and good character. Nobody is convinced that she was going to take her own life because she brings death to the world. That's fucking retarded. Especially when death is threatening the world and the people she loves. So why the fuck of all times would she be giving up now? Thrawn is on her doorstep. Everyone she loves needs her and she has no significant reason to think she would lose. There you go. That's why we're here. To see Anakin Skywalker crossing over into Vader, igniting a red lightsaber, looking evil. Cause that shit is awesome. That shit is Star Wars. Live or die. <gasps> Incorrect. Seriously, just have him say nothing at this point. It would be better. Jesus, fu what hell cringe is dribbling onto my screen? Get out of this fucking universe, you Vader-obsessed wannabe shitwits. It's the breathing, the red lightsaber, the fucking outfit every goddamn time. You cannot tell a fucking story that doesn't revolve around the same five people in this piss stain of a universe. And why, on top of everything, must I watch these icons of Star Wars deliver the fucking dialogue equivalent of rotting clown semen? Time to die. Fuck me, I guess they brought in Hayden Christensen not just for the member berries, but because they needed an expert in delivering emaciated, thudding, ass-cream dialogue. Liar! I choose to live. Okay, so like, she chooses to live, meaning that uh, Ahsoka was considering choosing to die because her path is that of death and destruction and Vader because making Anakin fight her. She's now choosing to live, she's gonna fight to live where others failed, where her master went to the dark side or something, I don't know. There's hope for you yet. Then, through some bullshit mechanics I'm not even gonna bother talking about, she's fished out of drowning and jumps into a whale and travels to Thrawn. This episode was simultaneously packed with worthless bullshit and crushed at the moments of anything meaningful trying to claw its way onto the screen. The time-wasting signature of Dave Filoni is alive and well. He takes incredible resources and lets them spill across the floor with no more purpose in delivery than a drunken octopus tossing darts at a board of emotional illusion. All in favor of telling a completely hollow piece of piss story that came out of nowhere just to go nowhere for the explicit seconds of fan service and distraction from just how little substance remains in this dilapidated prolapsing franchise that people have the balls to call genius in execution. Hey, Filoni, you are so genius. One of the best shots in Star Wars history. Argue with a wall. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Anakin. What if I want to stop fighting? Then you'll die. The Vader silhouette, I'm so unwell. Hashtag Ahsoka Tano, hashtag Tano Tuesday, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. If Dave Filoni could be nominated for any of his shots, it's this one. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Ahsoka spoilers. Someone pointed out how Anakin is surrounded by people and friends and instead Vader is all alone. What the fuck did you notice about the shots before noticing that. I can't stop thinking about this scene. Hashtag Anakin, hashtag Anakin Skywalker, hashtag Darth Vader, hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Ahsoka Tano, hashtag Tano Tuesday, hashtag Star Wars, hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Ahsoka spoilers. That flicker between Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader is one of the smoothest, cleanest, and sickest things Star Wars has ever done fire. Have you seen editing before? Have you seen anything before? Nothing will never not make this terrifying. This is Darth Vader. Hashtag Star Wars, hashtag Darth Vader, hashtag Anakin, hashtag Ahsoka. This is the Darth Vader Obi-Wan denied Emperor Palpatine. Hashtag Anakin, hashtag Anakin Skywalker, hashtag Darth Vader, hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Ahsoka Tano, hashtag Tano Tuesday, hashtag Star Wars. Whoever thought to merge Anakin's regular voice with Vader's cyborg voice when saying, you lack conviction. 
deserves a raise. This was spine tingling. Hashtag Star Wars. Hashtag A-H-S-O-K-A. This is probably the best shot I have ever seen in Star Wars. What is so fucking good about it? Is it that he's a good man and that he's Anakin? But oh no, he's a bad man too and there's Vader. Oh, uh, ah Ahsoka sees him as both Anakin the master and the goodman, but oh no, she sees him as Vader the badman. Dave F-I-L-O-N-I needs to be kept on by Disney for life. Hashtag Ahsoka. Siege of M-A-N-D-A-L-O-R-E-I did not know you had this in you Dave Felony hashtag Ahsoka. Dave Felony writing the script for episode 5 of hashtag Ahsoka hashtag Ahsoka Tano. Clearly Favreau and Felony know how to include legacy characters in ways that actually serve the story and drive the plot forward folded hands I trust them. To label these as fan service is to miss the point of their role entirely. Hashtag Ahsoka hashtag Anakin Skywalker hashtag The Mandalorian hashtag Luke Skywalker. Wait a minute we sure we don't want Dave F-I-L-O-N-I to give us a Clone Wars movie. Loudly crying. Hashtag Ahsoka. Anakin and Ahsoka with Sith eyes fire 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 Dave F-I-L-O-N-I cook. Okay so it's agreed that episode 5 of Ashoka is the best thing Disney has done with Star Wars period right? Like this was peak Star Wars. Star Wars is fucked. If you skip this episode Ahsoka simply needed to chase the bad guys inside a whale which is fucking retarded in and of itself, her existential crisis came from nothing and is resolved with ease in minutes. The idea that this is one of her most important character episodes and all of the context to understand it is apparently from countless seasons of other TV shows. That's absolutely embarrassing. Regardless, Ahsoka is and will be no different from before to after this event in how Rosario Dawson portrays her because she has been portraying her as a dissatisfied brick in key emotional moments of this series already. Now! Except now. Now she's wearing white clothing because that's the only fucking thing they know how to do. This is peak Star Wars. Peak Star Wars is Dave Filoni discovering CGI smoke, a visual that can barely be accredited to him before Jon Favreau, before Gareth Edwards, before, well... Ugh, ain't it fucking depressing to know just how stale these ideas are? Anakin and the world between worlds annihilates what we understand to be his relationship with Luke and raises more questions than the fucking hyperspace kamikaze. Is this Anakin? Is this fragments of his life through time brought together to reach out to Ahsoka? Is this Ahsoka's vision of him? Is this a photocopy of him from a particular era? Is this a force ghost? Is this a combination of the lot? You understand that the meaning of everything coming from his end changes dramatically dramatically depending on the answer. Luke Skywalker should be incredibly relevant to this whole series, but for some reason we're pretending like this isn't a time where he would be most active in the universe. He would be hell-bent on stopping any Empire loyalists from resurrecting the regime and the war. He's not a worthless, titty-sucking hobo yet. There are countless coming events that Anakin needs to tell Ahsoka about. There are countless pieces of information that he could have given her. Hera should be fucking fired for getting two men killed while dragging a child into an active war zone on an unsanctioned, batshit, crazy mission. Sabine should be stripped of her armor and lightsaber before she facilitates the victory for the Empire once again in future by being a bratty fucking idiot. Also, she should have died like 17 times by now. And you know what? The worst of it is the plot. The show is almost entirely plot. Plot, plot, fucking plot. What little character there is amounts to, I'm a general, fuck off. I'm confused, but I like Ezra. Fuck off. And finally, I crossed my arms like in the cartoon. Now drool for me. For fuck's sake. This video explored three episodes of television. Episodes where our main character is locked in an otherworldly state thinking about how her legacy is death. That she should simply give up, only to realize she is wrong, escaping that loop and fighting hard to get back to the world of the living. Two episodes were from two of my favorite television shows of all time. Shows featuring characters that are essentially trapped within their own thoughts, feelings, memories, and flaws. They spend the runtime discovering more about their own lives, motivations, values, and interpersonal dynamics than the total character development on display in all seasons of all Star Wars TV shows put together. Outside of the good one, of course. The characters are treated with great respect, and they each have realizations all ranging from intense horror, motivated senses of purpose and responsibility, all the way over to love and relief that will go on to change everything they understand about the world and themselves, prompted by incredibly dramatic events that will stick with them forever, 
regarding insecurities and flaws they've been dealing with since the beginning. They are absolute bangers of character exploration and share a very surprising amount in terms of structure and execution, despite the fact that we have here a supernatural horror drama and an animated comedy. And these are far from the only examples of writers who belt out absolute beasts of storytelling with this format. It's the impressive power of that craft. It's why we remember them. Ahsoka, much like mostly anything Disney produces these days, is a fucking blight on storytelling. It's dragging down every last aspect while using the very few easy elements it's familiar with to blind its audience as much as possible, to manipulate using nostalgia, and to dissuade anyone from noticing the hollow, desolate, creative, bleached bones of the storytelling beneath. It's pretending to be a story. It's incredible how much those who love the episode disagree as to what it's about, adding all kinds of content that absolutely wasn't there beyond an evil eye glance or glitchy fucking Vader visual. The episode plays at the idea of a woman who believes her legacy is death with no backing beyond her mentor having become Darth Vader. Other than that, there's nothing in the writing or the performances in the entire season leading up to it. A conflict that lacks foundation when she should know about Vader's lasting legacy. A conflict that lacks focus because unlike Buffy, she did not reach a moment of almost wanting a loved one to die to release her from responsibility. A conflict that cannot be less relevant when the universe hangs in the balance of Ahsoka being able to stop Thrawn. We play at the idea of her being on the cusp of death, of contemplating suicide because of her guilt and the desire to stop fighting in a world where she could cause so much destruction within. A conflict that lacks focus because unlike Leela, nobody has been killed thanks to her flaws. Only soldiers dying in a war to defend the world from tyranny. Something that requires far more contemplation and understanding for an audience than Rosario Dawson crossing her arms. But no, it's all about actually how her lineage stretches through all of the Jedi and that her legacy is to train the next one in Sabine. That's daunting considering the death and destruction that comes from training anyone this way. Which is insane considering the dramatic and immense amount of good that Ahsoka has done as a result of her training that isn't even brought up. But no, it's about how Ahsoka wants to be close with Sabine and train her, only she fears a betrayal or a turn or abandonment, even though her switch to train Sabine happened in a couple of seconds, with all the facial expression of a fucking mollusk. But no, it's about how she doesn't like to take risks, she'd rather destroy the star map and condemn Sabine to a life of wondering what if than take the chance at something better. What? She wanted to destroy it to prevent the bad guys from reaching Thrawn. If she wanted to destroy it in general, she would have done it in episode one. The key to understanding the cope of the fans with this one is right here. This isn't explicit. I know. But I think it's implied. The episode does have some explicit bits. The summary of which would be, People die when I involve myself and I could fall in the same way my master did, I should stop fighting. Yeah, but you gotta fight or you die. Well then I choose to live and also not be a bad man, like you were. And this was brought on by utterly invented horseshit. Interpretation 723 is that Ahsoka sees her life as that of within the shadow of Anakin Skywalker, and thus dies. Darth Vader. Will she make his mistakes, and is it because of her lack of action that he fell? Anakin wants to teach her that she can move well beyond him and live her best life anew. Baptized in fire, free of concern that she would ever make his mistakes, blah blah blah. It's like people ignored everything that set this up and then they hyper embellish what this actually was to compensate for their desire to love Star Wars. <laughs> He vadered! Oh, oh, oh. oh wow. wow. To be in that content position with the wonderful franchise at all costs. Good job, Dave. Dave Filoni, yeah! Wow. Well done, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Dave Filoni. You have my soul. Dave Filoni, I am not worthy. Filoni should be thankful so many people are writing in all of the meat and weight of these scenes for him when there's little to no evidence of a deft hand in expression packaged with dialogue that would give the asylum a run for their money. The reality is obvious. Ahsoka is not Buffy. She hasn't spent more than five years having everyone die around her, knowing her predecessors all die young and in combat, knowing that anyone she loves is doomed when spending any time anywhere near her 
and to have the most precious thing in her life taken away despite every last effort to prevent it, prompting despair. Ahsoka is not Leela, a woman who made poor decisions in favor of her own pride that almost killed her crewmate, leading to contemplating suicide in order to dull the pain. Leela believed a permanent sleep would have her reach Fry once again after killing him, only to realize that waking up will take her right to him. Buffy believed she killed Dawn due to her actions, only to be brought out by knowing her inaction will create that outcome. Anakin simply said this dumb shit. It means you still have a chance to live. Live or die. And you'll die. Time to die. There's hope for you yet. This is nothing. Ahsoka is a teenage storyteller's love of Star Wars as an IP come to vague life. Is she younger? It's young Ahsoka. That's young Ahsoka. Ah, clones! Walking around in a clip show of everything we love to recognize. <laughs> this is the coolest thing I've ever witnessed in Star Wars. Some of the best Star Wars content, period. Are we gonna get Rex? <laughs> It's Rex. <laughs> a simple trick of the light, a stencil of a shadow of a stain of storytelling, nothing more. She is a Rubik's Cube with every colour on every side matching the shade of her oh so fucking special lightsabers. Turn and twist your interpretation to your heart's content and I'm sure you'll feel you've hit on something every time you reach a conclusion. I'm here to finish your training. Uh, oh, no. <gasps> ah. Tips because you'd rather avoid admitting you enjoy this for the shallow and meaningless fucking key jangling it clearly is. Oh, oh wait oh, a minute! Oh, Rex! Rex, there he is! Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Ahsoka Spoliers. Seeing Rex live action had me bawling. Wish we could have gotten to see Temuera's face in this episode, but I will take what I can get. Loudly crying yellow heart. <laughs> Red. That's red. We should all demand something better. The journey in this episode totaled at about three minutes, cutting out the immense fucking filler. Beyond that, we had about five lines in total that are relevant to what kind of arc Ahsoka is supposed to be experiencing. Somehow, all of that is remembered as a great character study the second Filoni rolls out Vader. Darth fucking Vader. Because let's be honest, this cracked cacophony of surface-level character exploration was entirely forced upon Ahsoka in order to throw Anakin at the audience. OMG, I'm not crying loudly crying hard. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. I am not okay. This is everything. They did it. They really did it face holding back tears. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Anakin, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. Hashtag Ahsoka spoilers. This is everything loudly crying. I see Hayden watch the Clone Wars very carefully and I love him for that. Even the body language is the same. The way he looks it's unbelievable. Just like 2005, just like in Rots. Anakin's face when he's proud of Ahsoka. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag the Clone Wars. Hashtag Hashtag Anakin, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. Mentally, I'm still here. Hello. Hashtag Ahsoka spoiler. Da, 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 He did the thing. Hashtag Anakin. The true Darth Vader. Hashtag Star Wars. Vader transitioning to Anakin was pure cinema one. Hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Anakin, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. The goat, hashtag Anakin Skywalker, hashtag Ahsoka. Years ago, if you told me that one day we'd see Hayden Christensen return to play Darth Vader, but without his suit, wielding a red lightsaber and fighting his apprentice from the animated series, I'd call you crazy. Hashtag Star Wars. Then and now hashtag the Clone Wars hashtag Ahsoka hashtag Anakin. OML like live action fucking Clone Wars I-S-C-R-E-A-M-E-D-D-D. -D -D -D. Also I already tweeted about it, but live action Anakin in the Clone Wars outfit A-H-H-H. Hashtag Ahsoka Tano hashtag Ahsoka hashtag Anakin hashtag Tano Tuesday. Breaking. Latest episode of Ahsoka reminds fans that The Clone Wars was a series they watched once. It was supported more so by things you recognize than anything substantive to draw from her journey, and it was delivered with dialogue about as graceful and considered as a dead elephant trying to play fucking Jenga. Tell me what's going on. The battle's not over yet. There are more Separatist droids approaching. This is the Clone Wars! Time to die. But who cares, right? These shitty stories don't do well critically or commercially, so eventually they'll have to write something good. I mean, imagine a Star Wars story about the concept of oppressive systems and their construction, destruction, and rippling effects that blur the line of admirable and dubious action. Perhaps this theoretical television series could show us what kinds of people are created and destroyed by those very systems. 
systems. Yeah, they made that. It was called Andor, nobody saw it, and most of the people who gave it a shot thought it was boring. It's gonna get another season, if it's lucky to then be lost to the annals of television history where no one will reference it again. And that's not to imply this was all fucked from the get-go. It could have worked. You could have written this to take inspiration from stories that have nailed this in the past. You could have tried to write a story. Like Leela in Futurama, Ahsoka could have been challenged on her skill by Balin and his commentary on Anakin and Ahsoka's legacy to the point of losing her patience and demanding a one-on-one -on -one combat. She could have denied Hu Yang and Sabine's advice to remain a team while taking their opponents on, instead ordering Sabine to take out Shin while Ahsoka shows Balin what a true warrior looks like, echoing Anakin from so long ago. Perhaps it seems that Ahsoka is winning her fight, and at the climax, Sabine loses hers to Shin. She gets her legs chopped off in a particularly brutal back and forth. This gives Shin the opportunity to join Balin and they defeat Ahsoka together, an inverted way to foreshadow the lesson while giving Balin room to confirm this is all Ahsoka is. A curse on the world, death is the only thing she has to give and it's time she faces it herself. So he slashes her off the cliff, leaving her for dead. During her time in this ill-advised world between worlds thing, Anakin could explore the more obvious difficulty she's having in terms of what he and Ahsoka actually brought to the world when they were together, to then move into Ahsoka's insecurity on that topic being a weakness that has now gotten someone presumably killed. More than that, we could move into the line of masters and padawans inevitably leading to more potential destruction, that Sabine could become the next wayward student inflicting their malice on the world because of their master's failure. Anakin could remind Ahsoka of the good they did in the Clone Wars, remind her of the events as they happened, show her that a hell of a lot more came from the line of masters and padawans than Darth Vader, and even he made the right choice in the end. You could then take inspiration from Buffy, we can reach the core that Ahsoka is exhausted. She spent so much time fighting endless battles and figuring out what impact she'll have on the future that she feels immense guilt for the fact that she knew Sabine might die fighting Shin. And that, just for a moment, seemed like a relief. To relinquish the responsibility of training a Padawan, of continuing this line, of risking another Darth Vader. And then Anakin could give her every last lesson she would need. That Sabine has made mistakes, but she's not lost. The only way you lose her is to not get out there and fight for her. Fight for the world. And that Ahsoka may have felt what she felt, thought what she thought, and made those mistakes, but no matter what a person does, there's always a pathway back. A person is not simply their mistakes. All of these lessons and introspections, of course, meaning a hell of a lot coming from a post Return of the Jedi Anakin. However, as it stands, it doesn't seem clear that Ahsoka is all that much concerned about Sabine's fate in this episode at all. Most of the episode is confused, shallow, and absolutely meant to bait fans into a frenzy. Other than that, we had about 40% of the fucking episode devoted to Team Hera wandering about. But who cares? We've got Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka dueling, we had live-action Clone Wars, we had Darth Vader, and we had the world between worlds, and we had Tamura Morrison's voice, uh, the clone troopers, uh, we had the space whales, and we had the battle, and we had Rex, and we had Glup Shido, and we had Darth Vader breathing, and we had Anakin. No, it was Vader, but it was Anakin, but he, he said snips, he fucking said snips, that's what he called her in the cartoon. Hello, snips, hashtag Anakin Skywalker. Anakin Skywalker referencing his son Luke Skywalker to hashtag Ahsoka meant everything to me. Young Ahsoka Heart, hashtag Ahsoka, hashtag Clone Wars, hashtag the Clone Wars. Ahsoka Ahsoka's eyes change after stealing Anakin's saber in episode 5 of Hashtag Ahsoka Hashtag Ahsoka Tano Hashtag Ahsoka Spoilers I love the LOTR reference where she is now, cleansed and is now Ahsoka the White. Also love the baptism imagery to show how she's washing off her sins. Ahsoka the White White Heart. Hashtag Ahsoka. Am I the only one who wants a Darth Vader show? Hashtag Ahsoka. So Mike, are those prequels still the worst solace cash grabs full of nostalgia bait? You fat fuck. Hashtag Ahsoka Part 5. Shadow Warrior is currently at a 9.5 rating on IMDb, making it one of the highest rated Star Wars episodes ever. Really should be 9.7 or higher. It's unreal how epic and great this show is. We one man. Hashtag Ahsoka.
I found the sting because I was loving Futurama anyway. I found the weight of the world because I was loving Buffy anyway. My love for past work or IPs is what allows me to experience these stories. It got me to the point where I can consider what they mean to me and what they say about the people going through these journeys. They can help me recognize similar experiences in other characters, in other stories, or in people in real life. It's not enough for Leela to kick people while saying, Hi It's not enough for Buffy to say, I'm Buffy. The vampire slayer and you are? I need the structure, the foundation for substantive elements to actually fucking be there. It can't just be the goddamn jangling of tired old keys rusted from the fucking tears of elated fans coming to realize this skin-walking calamity is not what they think it is. But at least Anakin finally gets to save those he loves from death like he always wanted. Bitch, he already did that. And Ahsoka wasn't even remotely close to death. They're making that shit up as much as they made up the mechanics of this retarded fucking worlds between worlds shit too. But there it was, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader doing his thing and everyone freaked out. Loved it, as much as I'm sure they'll love it weeks from now when it sours like the foul piss that it is. Just like the beloved appearance of Anakin and Vader in Kenobi until everyone soured on that. Just like the beloved appearance of Cad Bane in Boba Fett until everyone soured on that. Just like the beloved appearance of Luke Skywalker in the finale of Mandalorian C Season 2 until everyone soured on that. Just like the... Just... Just trace it, guys. Trace it all the way back to Patient Zero. Chewie. We're home. The beloved appearance of the very characters that gave you something meaningful once upon a time being used to regenerate that experience they absolutely did not fucking earn. Ill-suited stewards of a bygone era trying to convince you they're the same as those who gave them the franchises to burn. Countless pathetic iterations marred by an unyielding and prideful ignorance floundering at every turn to create something meaningful. There's no reason they can't do this forever. There's nothing Nothing but reward for the simplest and most surface level mockery of what once was. When they can grip an entire fan base by the balls with just the sounds of breathing, the colors of light, and a handful of lines, I think it becomes pretty obvious. Star Wars. Star Wars cannot grow up. I would have preferred an entire episode of Anakin, but also I didn't really think they knew where they were going with it. What were you upset about earlier? I don't know, I don't remember. Me neither, but this is amazing! We were talking about Mara Jade earlier on, and yeah, who knows? There, there's this, always... That guy said yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, I knew this would happen, which is I give Thrawn, and, but <laughs> it's like, as soon as you give them, it must be like if you have a child, you give them a toy, and they're like, yay, what else have you got? <laughs> and it's like, no, no, play with Thrawn. Play with Thrawn for a little bit. It lasts but, for 30 seconds. Yeah, you know. Red. That's red.